Thank you very much. Uh, it's great to be, to be here. This is uh, uh, a wonderful privilege to be on this beautiful campus and uh, to see what all has been happening. We, of course, any of us who are involved in um, law and religion know about Brigham Young and certainly know about Cole and the center and the work of his staff, Don Liu, and so forth. And so it is indeed a great pleasure to be here. Today I want to uh, talk about, um, in essence, I'm going to give in 15 minutes my dissertation that I'm working on right now. Um, I've, been, uh, as, I've been involved very much in a case uh, in Canada right now dealing with the Trinity Western University case, a law school, whereby a Christian university wants to have a law school and has been receiving a lot of opposition uh, from the legal profession and from the legal academic field uh, because uh, the university requires its students to sign what they call a community covenant, uh, which uh, lists the expectations of the students when they come on campus. And as part of that community covenant, which is quite uh, actually a fairly lengthy document, uh, in comparison to what the issue is as to why individual or the legal profession is so uh, upset about this proposal. It has to do with a statement that says something to the effect that marriage or that they expect students to live in accordance with marriage as, or if they're married, as between a man and a woman, uh, the traditional marriage. Uh, this, as I mentioned, is a religious school. It is the Evangelical Free Church that uh, owns and operates the university. And it has also been involved in previous litigation back in uh, the late 1990s and into 2001, whereby the Supreme Court of Canada uh, had to deal with a case where they were receiving or seeking to get accreditation for their education degree uh, which um, the BC College of Teachers were rejecting uh, accreditation, again, based on its community covenant. That went up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court said that um, there was no evidence of the students who would graduate from that program being uh, discriminatory against um, students in the public school system where they would teach. Uh, be, uh, that whether or not the public school students being uh, homosexual or members of the LGBT community, uh, that those students who graduate from TWU would in any way discriminate. There was no evidence, and as a result, the Supreme Court of Canada ordered uh, for the accreditation of the education program at TWU. TWU thought that when they went with the law school proposal, They've already covered this ground and thought that they wouldn't have to worry about this kind of thing again as they introduce yet another new academic program. How wrong they were. So it's been uh, a case that's involved uh, a lot of issues, and I know I don't have much time to get into that case per se, but what that has done is it has caused me to step back and look at the, very, at the situation at hand and try to understand what's happening. Because on the one hand, one could say that there's legal precedent here for Trinity Western to receive approval uh, for its law school program. One would have thought that the 2001 case would be precedent and uh, would indeed govern the, the situation as it now uh, faces. However, that, it does not appear to be um, something that is persuasive in a large number of uh, legal academics and in the large, num uh, large section of the legal profession. Three law societies have uh, already decided that they, they will not accredit the program. And uh, virtually every single law faculty, we have 18 common law faculties in Canada, uh, we have uh, universities in uh, Quebec, but they are civil law, so they um, have not uh, really spoken out on this issue. But of all of the common law faculties of law, they've all passed uh, resolutions against the idea of Trinity Western being accredited at, uh, as a law school. So my mind began thinking about what's happening here, because on the one hand, Canada has a long tradition of religious freedom. Religious freedom is protected under the Charter. We have a lot of history 
uh, throughout, um, uh, certainly in the modern era, when I say modern, I mean up into uh, post-World War II, where you have a lot of case law uh, dealing with uh, minority groups such as, Trinidad, uh, such as Jehovah's Witnesses and so forth, who have received um, a very uh, fair hand, as it were, with respect to judgments from the Supreme Court uh, protecting religious freedom. In fact, in 2004, when the court was deciding on the marriage reference case, the court in its decision made a statement to the effect that the protection of religion is jealously guarded by the court. So one would have thought that given the position of religious uh, freedom in Canada that this would almost be a no-brainer. But yet there is such opposition, one wonders, okay, well, what's happening here? And so that's what I'm trying to determine. And I'm asking myself the question, what is it about religion, first of all, that has received special accommodation in the law, in liberal democratic societies? What is, what is the essence of religion? What is it about religion that we even have a situation where one would argue that religion has received this special status? Then whether or not this special status should continue is another question. And is it, is it possible that we have now arrived at a situation where religion is being, uh, of, or at least the legal ca academy, is of the view that religion should not have this special status that it has received under liberal democratic theory? So what I am uh, proposing in my study is uh, look at this concept and then try to be able to determine exactly what's happening. What I argue is that in essence, we are dealing with a situation where there is a legal revolution, I suggest, at hand. I think that what we are seeing is in fact um, a recognition in the legal community that the current legal status of religion being a protected right, receiving the special status and accommodation, may in fact now be challenged. And so we know, of course, about revolutions. When we think of um, the you know, religious revolutions throughout history, we can think of the Reformation. That totally changes the paradigm. And I, I'm su suggesting that one could uh, look at, from a conceptual point of view, think of uh, what happens in the scientific community when we have an established paradigm of understanding what the world is. And we can think about all kinds of, of uh, throughout the history of science, for example, where individual scientists have had a view with respect to what the world is. Um, you know, we can think of Galileo and his, uh, you know, the putting forth the arguments of Copernicus that in fact the earth is not the center of the universe, but it actually uh, is uh, going around the sun and so forth, but yet that required a total change of mindset, a, a paradigm shift. Now many uh, scientists have often argued, well, they are scientific, they're objective and so forth, and they're not subject to bias and, and all of those kinds of things. They always look at the evidence. And a study, of course, by uh, Thomas Kuhn back in the 1960s in which he entitled it The Structure of a Scientific Revolution, whereby he notices uh, a number of things about scientists and about the, um, uh, the, re the way in which, or the anatomy, as it were, of a scientific revolution. Um, he talks about, in his work, the concept of the paradigm and how that sets the mindset for uh, scientists to have a particular view and how they see the world, and then uh, in various uh, researches, uh, some anomalies arise, and this causes some uh, consternation within the paradigm. But for the most place, for the most part, scientists will try to explain that anomaly based on the overall paradigm. But if there's an increasing number of anomalies, then what happens is the paradigm becomes so stretched that it creates a crisis moment a crisis moment whereby people began to question, well, is the paradigm actually true? And so then there's a whole uh, discussion about, about that, and eventually there's a certain moment, 
And con, uh, you know, it's kind of like the eureka moment where somebody, maybe that was, uh, as he mentions in his research, some scientists would say that they were in a shower and all of a sudden they connect all the dots and they say, aha, in fact, the quantum theory is in fact true. You know, Einstein has his moments of understanding that perhaps Isaac Newton wasn't absolutely correct when it, uh, with his views on, on the gravitational, of the law of gravitation and so forth, and the, the law of, with respect to light and all the rest of it. And so I'm questioning and I'm asking, has the legal profession in Canada, has the paradigm of religious freedom being uh, such an important part in the liberal democratic theory, have we come to a point where perhaps we're now at a point where there's a paradigm shift in the making, where once religion was extremely important for liberal democracy to uh, exist, uh, the history, um, I look at the history, I look at uh, philosoph philosophy and so forth, the importance of religion. I look at the pragmatic aspects with respect to religion. And are we now at a point where there may in fact be a legal revolution with respect to religion? And what would that look like? And so that's what I am um, looking at with respect to uh, this whole question, looking at the broader impact of Trinity Western University and this particular case. Now, it seems to me that in answering the question, why religion, it occurs to me that there are three reasons as to why religion has been protected in Western liberal democratic thought and, and history. How am I doing on time? Am I doing okay? Four minutes. I gotta do 50 minutes in four minutes, so here it goes. So it's kind of like taking a drink from a fire hose, but we'll manage. I'm, my sense is, is that the reason why religion has been so important and protected in liberal democratic thought is because, first of all, there's a philosophical reason. As human beings, we ask big questions. We ask, where did we come from? Where are we going? How did we get here? And in all areas of human endeavor, we see those same kinds of questions being asked. We see asked by the, what we now call scientists, but were once known as natural philosophers, of trying to figure out the whole concept and the history of mankind. Scientists today are out in outer space trying to determine the Big Bang Theory. So in our search, we also had just political philosophy, religious philosophy, and we're asking these big questions. Part of that big question, after trying to just give you the highlights as I go through here, but is the concept of sovereignty. To whom do I hold allegiance to? Who is, am I responsible for? In our history, we have seen that in the Roman times, the uh, emperor was not only the temporal king, but he was also the spiritual God of the society. He was God and King. And there was this unification of the state. In fact, I suggest divinity of the state. Now, this has been challenged over through history, but in the modern age, I'll skip a whole bunch here, but in the modern age, we've also come back to the idea of the Christian concept of rendering to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, to God's the things that are God's. And so we got this, again, bifurcation and development of enlightenment and all the rest. So what I'm arguing is that in the midst of this revolution that's going on in the law, that what is happening when you do not allow the individual and the community that they come from to be able to establish for themselves to whom they owe responsibility, i.e. their responsibility in the religious faith, that if the state then says that you must follow what we say is the legal norm with respect in this case to marriage, in essence the state is determining for the individual to whom they hold ultimate responsibility and that, I'm suggesting, is a merging back together of the divinity of the state, which I think is very problematic in the long term for democratic society. 